Okay, good morning class on this rainy Tuesday morning. Thanks for showing up. I don't know why I should thank you for that, but thank you anyways. Uh, today we're finally going to get into our first control structure, the if-then-else statement. <clears throat> this is something that I find quite easy. Um, I don't know if it's just something that's so obvious to me I'm not able to explain it properly, but if I'm not explaining something properly, please stop me, uh, because this can get kind of tricky. Um, let me point out that we've already seen a simple one-line, in-line, if statement. Just let me check that we're recording. I think we are. Yeah. Um, I wrote something like this the other week, right? X is equal to 7. If A is less than B, else it's 6. So what do you think this evaluates to if I ask for the value of X? Let's walk through this. So X is 7. If A is less than B, what does this evaluate to? True. OK, so if this is true, then it's going to set X to 7. Another one. Y equals 0 if X is less than 7, else it's X. What's the value Oh, of Y? <laughs> I showed the answer. Well, let's walk through this. Y equals 0 if 7 is less than 7, which is false, else it's 7. So Y gets 7. Uh, these inline ifs are quite useful when you want to make a return statement. So I can make a function called f. I can return hello if x is greater than 0, else world. And if I call f of 1, it calls this function with x equals 1. It says return hello if 1 is greater than 0, else world. 1 is greater than 0, so it returns hello. A more sort of specific definition of the if statement, a formal definition of the if statement. If you give me a condition, and a condition is just any predicate statement, and remember any predicate statement is something that evaluates to true or false. An if statement is a control structure that executes a block of code when C is true. Right? C being short for condition. Right? So a condition is simply something that evaluates to true or false. The general structure of an if statement in Python looks something like this. It's if, then you give it your condition, which again is something that evaluates a true or false. You say colon, and then you indent your code to indicate that the indented code belongs to that if statement. <clears throat> so you remember when you write your definitions that you have to have four tabs, uh, four spaces. Right? That indicates that code belongs to that definition in, in, in the exact similar way the four spaces here indicate that the block of code belongs to the if statement, which is relevant because these if statements are going to allow us to skip some code. Right, so we have if condition, and if that condition is true, there's code that's execute, executed. <clears throat> Sometimes it's useful to draw these if statements as decision trees or flowcharts. You may have done some flowcharts in high school. Uh, we usually denote decisions by a diamond. So diamonds really uh, you can see as evaluating some condition, right? So the if statement, this one, can be drawn like this, right? So you have if some condition is true, then run this code and then continue with the program. Rather, if the condition is false, then you just continue with the program. Um, this is sort of more wordy of a diagram than we normally draw. Typically, I, I'm going to draw this instead. Right? Anything in a blue block is just implicitly assumed to be code, and anything in diamonds are assumed to be decisions. Right? So again, I can say if the condition is true, then execute the if code. If the condition is false, then just continue with the program. Oh, and I should have completed this way. If the condition is true, run the if code, and then continue with the program. So here's our, uh, our first example of an if statement. If x is set to 1, and then I have an if statement that says if 0 is equal to 7, then increment x by 1 by 1. What is the value of x? 1, right? Because I'm going to walk through this. x is 1. This is false, surely. Uh, and because this is false, this if statement gets skipped. The, the code is literally skipped. Right? Here's another one. 
x is 1 over 1 if the type of x is an integer increment x by 1 what is the value of x huh 1.0 right cuz remember this is integer division i'm just trying to train you to do well in your midterms cuz it's all going to be like i don't want to say stupid but it's it's going to be little nuances like this which we're going to try to use to trick you so this was a twofer. This, this is me showing you how to do an if statement and check the type of something. We have this thing called is, right? It, it, that's when you want to test that something belongs to a category. X is, is the string hello world. And I have a if statement that reads, if H is in the collection of characters that comprise hello world, then X is is equal to goodbye plus the minus six to n slice of hello world. So I'm trying to combine some of the things we learned. So x is is what? So let's walk through this. Uh, x is is hello world. Is h in the collection of x's? Yes, that evaluates to true, so this code gets executed. So x's gets goodbye plus one, two, three, four, five, world and the space, um, which prints goodbye world which is a little bit more dark than I intended it would be, but <laughs> so be it. Repeating the example, we have x is equals hello world. If a is in the collection of x's, assign x's to empty. What is the value of x's? Hello world. I'm going to walk through this. So x's gets assigned this string. Uh, if a is in x's, so we, we look at a is in x's, there is no A in hello world. That evaluates to false. This code is skipped. We get to X's, and it's hello world. Good job. <clears throat> Back to prints, because it seems no matter how many times I repeat myself, this is going to be a source of confusion. So maybe this will help us understand. I'm going to define a function foo that takes a value X and prints positive if X is greater than 0 and prints large positive if X is greater than 10 to the power of 5. I'm going to assign answer the result of foo when given 10 to the power of 6. Shiza. What prints? Okay, so let's walk through this. I give foo 10 to the power of 6. It steps into foo with x equal 10 to the power of 6. 10 to the power of 6 is greater than 0, so it prints positive. It goes to the next line here. It tests uh, if x... 10 to the power of 6 is greater than 10 to the power of 5, and then it prints positive. And then it returns. If you don't put a return statement in your function, Python will return none. Right? So if I ask for the type of answer, it's going to be, thank you, none. Right? So what I'm trying to indicate with this example is that if you have a bunch of if statements in sequence, uh, they each get an opportunity to toggle, right, to either print or not print. I'm going to define a very similar function called bar, and I'm going to say if x is greater than 0, return positive, the string, uh, and if x is greater than 10 to the power of 5, return large positive. So what happens if I assign the results of bar when called with 10 to the power of 6 to answer? Okay, so first of all, it returns a string, and it is positive. Okay, good. You guys are smarter than the other class. Don't tell the other class. Okay, because re remember, as soon as we hit a return statement, we're going to exit the routine. Right, so I walked into bar with x equals 10 to the power of 6. 10 to the power of 6 is greater than 0, uh, so it returns positive. What would have happened if I stepped into this function with negative 1? It would have returned what? None. OK, so let, let's give that a try, just so I can waste some time. Uh, let's do this. Let's touch. What day is it? Tuesday? Tuesday? Uh, OK. As I always do, I'm just going to give her one of these. Perfect. So I had something like define bar of x 
if x is greater than 0, then I print uh, returned uh, positive. Uh, if x is greater than 10 to the power of 5, I return big positive. And I'm asking if I set answer equal to bar of negative 1, what should the type of answer be? So let's just give this a run. None. Right? So if I walked into here with a value for x, negative 1, this is false, so this code gets skipped. This is false, so this code gets skipped. And since, now I guess I have to amend my statement. Because I said something like, if you don't re include a return statement, Python is going to include one for you and return none, which is still true. But here's an example of a function which has returns in it that still returns none. Right? So I, I amend my statement to say, if in the execution of your definition, no return statement is executed, Python will return none at the end of its execution. If it gets to the last line, it just assumes that this is here. Right? So I guess the statement's still correct. Right? The last line of any, of any function is return not. Okay, so I hope that's clear, that, we, that both of these conditions were skipped. If false, answer is equal to 0, what is the value of answer? So I put false there, right? So there's no confusion as to what is being skipped, right? So I enter this if statement, if false, skip, right? So what is the stored in answer? Answer is not defined, right? So Python is literally skipping code in the if statement, right? So if you get funny errors regarding non-definitions of names that you're certain you've defined, you, you may have done something like this. You may have an if statement that's actually skipped over the assignment. So for this, what we'd want to do is definitely give answer a default value, um, which means that I need to assign a value to answer when the condition fails, <clears throat> which we're going to uh, introduce else statements for. But before that, one more example. Um, so for those of you, maybe not from the English world, um, you can have a bank account, and if your bank account has positive money in it, it's, it's referred to as being in the black, right? They used to print books with your balance in it, and if it was a good balance, it would print in the black. And if you got, went into debt, your balances would be printed in red, right? So in this case, I want to set a flag for the system to print in black or print in red. So I can say, if the balance is greater than or equal to zero, then set in the black to true and in the red to false. Otherwise, consecutively, if balance is less than zero, then set in the black to false and in the red to true. Now this, this statement is perfectly logically fine, but it's wasteful and ugly for a few reasons, right? First of all, this condition isn't very hard to check, right? It's, it's, it's basically one machine instruction to determine if an integer is bigger than another integer. But imagine I was testing some condition that was extremely expensive, right? Suppose this if statement took 10 minutes to evaluate the truth of. I would do it, and then I would repeat the same computation again, right? So this could be wasteful in that you're checking the condition twice. <clears throat> it also makes our code longer because I had to use two if statements. Really what I want here <clears throat> is a mechanism to say, when this condition is true, do this. And otherwise, when the condition has failed, do something else. I want to add another branch to my if statement. So we can do that. So we started with an if then, which gives us the capacity to skip code. I'm now going to introduce if then else, which will give us a full branch. <clears throat> so I can write in Python, if condition, then code will execute. And if this condition is false, then it will go to the else block. Right. So if true code else if condition was false, run this code instead, and then continue with the program. This is how it looks like when I amend the diagram to include the if statement. Right? So now, if the condition is true, we run some if code and continue. Rather, if the condition is false, then we run some else code and then continue. Formally, this else code didn't exist. 
false just continued. So now definitely new code is going to be executed in this if state. So here's the same example that I said was ugly, now made less ugly. Um, I can say if balance is greater than or equal to zero, then in the black is true, in the red is false, else in the black is false and in the red is true, right? So in this case, extra code will be executed, right? One of, one of these two blocks must execute, right? So the else is always going to capture um, the if statement if your first condition has failed. So I can show you now a better way of defining that if you wanted to define A, I could say something like if 1 is greater than 0, then assign A to 0, else um, A gets negative 1, perhaps it's a default value, right? And now if I look at A, it's going to be defined, right, as 0, right, because 1 was greater than 0. I, I maybe should have made this fail. And now it's negative 1. All right. So if you're going to define a name in an if statement, you sure as hell better uh, use an else to give it a default value, or you're going to introduce some uh, hard-to-find bugs into your code. OK, so let's write now a function that returns the longer of two strings. So we did this already, uh, but let's do it again. And I'm going to do it three times to show you uh, that if state, like there's never one way to write a function. There usually is better ways to write functions, but let me just show you that already given the tools that I've given you, we can write this in three different ways. Okay, so define uh, longest string. It takes string one and string two. Going to give my doc string. Oh, did you guys submit your assignment yet? Okay, did you guys read the explanation on the grading? Okay, I'm going to pause the... Uh, the lecture for a moment because um, I don't want all of you to stress out because there's three possible grades that you can get here. Uh, maybe I'll start from the end. 100, 50, 0. Okay? So your code, as we discussed, is going to be loaded by our grader. And so remember how I gave you a question that said, uh, confirm if student volume works for three examples? We didn't, we didn't even go to three examples. We're, we're testing two examples on your code. And one of them is zero, right? So we're going to test that zero times something times something gives us zero. And I think one times two times three gives us six. So if you pass both of those conditions, if you're, first of all, if your file loads, good. And then we call your code and check those two things. If you pass both tests, 100, you pass one test, which I, I don't even know how that would happen, that you could get half of them right. But maybe you return zero in all cases. You get 50. Otherwise, you get zero. OK, so. If you uploaded your file incorrectly, if there are syntax errors in it, uh, if there are other minor problems like this, if you didn't follow the um, function signature properly, you're going to get a zero. Don't stress out, because remember, you will get another opportunity to submit this assignment for 80% of the uh, grade. Okay? So, and you should for sure at least try to get an 80 on this assignment, because this assignment was the assignment that we were using to test that you could submit, right? So if you can't figure out how to submit your assignments, we're going to have a problem, right? So just please try and figure out how to uh, submit your assignments. Maybe I should make that a passing condition for this course, right? Figuring out how to use the online assignment system. OK, so game on. Lecture unpaused. OK, so back to here. I'm going to write in my um, signature here. So it takes a string and a string, and it returns a string. Uh, returns the longer of two strings. Can anyone find the edge case here? Yes. If the, equal. if the string lengths are equal, what should we do? Right, that's a perfect example of an edge case condition. So I'm just going to uh, append to here. Returns the longer of two strings, returning uh, string one if tied <laughs> for longest. Right. So perfect. So here it should be a hello, sorry, longest string, hello world. That should return hello, uh, longest string, fancy uh, pants. Oh, no, that, that doesn't work. 
fancier pants, right? Should return fancier. Um, and a word about these doc strings. There's like no real official way of writing a doc string. This is just sort of seems to be like the style that most people have converged on. But like, again, this is uh, this is just ignored. I can do anything I want here, right? So it's not like this is getting run or anything. This is just our way of saying, oh, this is this is an input. There is a way to actually write um, test cases in here in that they'll they'll run somehow, but that's well beyond uh, the scope of this course. So, and also a word about um, type checking. Okay, everyone seems to be stressed out about well, what happens if the programmer passes me like a value that I'm not that the function's not supposed to be taking. Um, another word for this signature is contract. And why do you think we call it a contract? It's called the contract because it's like I, a programmer, am entering a contract with you, the other programmer, that says, provided you give me two strings, you're going to get a string back. Right? If you give me something that aren't two strings, this thing is going to cark it. It's going to fail. Right? So if I call your function wrong, that's on me. Right? Furthermore, checking types is expensive. Right? The computer actually has to stop and look at every object and see that it's an integer, that it's a float. Um, so usually when we design libraries, it happens like this. You have all of your core functionality, and then on top of that is a user layer. Right? And the user layer is where the type checking happens. Right? So it says, so it's just basically preventing the user from using the real tools. Right? And lastly, uh, type checking is the very, very, very last thing you're going to write in a library, right? The, the user level code. And you probably won't even write it. Right? You, you give it to some undergrad <laughs> to do for you, right? So this is basically scrub work, right? So don't worry about type checking, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's boring programming. It's not necessary. Just enter these contracts with us, right? So provide a contract and then I can't get angry if I use it wrong. I will get angry if your contract is wrong, right? If I pass you two strings and it still fails, then I'll say, I gave you two strings. I've not violated your contract, so what, what's going on? Right, so I don't want any more questions about, do I have to type check for the assignment? Unless we explicitly say so, don't. I don't even, do you guys even know how to do the type checking? I just showed you like a minute ago. Right, so I don't even know how you guys were doing the type checking in the, in the first place. OK, so geez, back, back. Back to if statements. <laughs> um, so how can I do this? So we had lengths, right? So uh, I can do it like this. I'll show you three ways of doing it. Um, if the length of string 1 is greater than the length of string 2, then we can return string 1, right? And then I can either say, I can say else return string 2. Does everyone see how that would work? Should we call it a bit? That's true. That is true. I made the exact same mistake last time, and it was on purpose. So thank you for catching my deliberate mistake. Uh, I'm going to call longest string here. Let's try our examples. Hello, world. Let's just give that a print so we can actually see it. Print longest string, fancier pants. Now let's give that a run. What have I done? Line 18. Oh, I missed a bracket. And I missed a bracket here. Hello, that's correct. Fancier, that's correct. OK, so that's maybe it's a little big. Uh, will this still work? Well, I took the else statement out. And I'm asking, will it still work? Huh? Will it? Re when will it return two values? But w w in what instance would this definition return two values? So what happens if this if statement triggers true? Then it will return, right? End of function. OK, well, I'm going to run this to show you that, yes, it still works, right? Exactly the same way, right? 
because this return escaped the function. Right? It has no opportunity to run anything else. Right? And if this failed, so if this fails to run, what assumption can be made here? Well, that that condition evaluated to false, but, but that uh, this is the case. Right? So skipping over that if statement means that at this point in the code, that is, that's the condition. Right? So in fact, those two statements I wrote were equivalent. And so this is why the return statement can get kind of sort of weird, because it allows you to skip things. Yeah, go to the lab and, 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 and play with this a little bit, because I know, I know it can be kind of confusing. But it was equivalent right? if I do this. Because it just said, if this is true, then execute this. Uh, rather, execute this. And this logically is saying, if this is true, then execute this. Otherwise, continue the code. Right? OK, another way of doing it. Um, return string 1 if the length of string 1 is greater than or equal to the length of string 2, else string 2. That, that's, an, that's the inline way of doing it, a little fancier. So I kind of prefer the inline way, but um, it, it gets, you can get some pretty crazy long statements like this. So I, I'm not going to say one way is better than another because this, uh, this version here makes it a lot more clear um, what's happening. All right. So I wrote the answer in the slide so you don't have to worry about copying it down or anything. Here's another example of ugly code, which I want to clean up by adding more functionality to the if statement. So more bank examples. So suppose a customer has some type of credit variable associated with them, and this credit score can be poor, good, or excellent. And I want to write some code that acts upon each of those options and throws an error or prints something uh, to catch the exception. That is when the credit is not neither of those three things. So I can say, if your credit is poor, print no credit for you. If credit is good, print maybe credit for you. If credit is excellent, print let me give you credit. Now, that's fine. That, that's not too, too ugly. The problem here is now I want to say something like, if nothing had printed previous to this, then print you don't have a credit score, like obtain a credit score. So currently, I have to do it like this, right? If credit is not equal to poor, and credit is not equal to good, and credit is not equal to excellent, print obtain credit score. I basically had to capture in a line uh, all of the previous conditions, right? Would an, if, would an else statement help in this case? No. We don't have arrays yet. <laughs> yes, there is a better way of solving all these questions if I have the total Python tool set. Yeah. Well, which, which one should I append else to? But then it's going to trigger immediately. I want to trigger a statement that prints obtain a credit score if your credit is neither poor, good, nor excellent. So what I'm saying is, go ahead. Yeah, but we don't have that yet. You could, you could append an else to the first one, and then check the other ones, and append the else to the other ones. So you want to nest them? I mean, if we don't have okay, that else. Okay, sure. So his answer was he has no idea, and he apologizes for answering. No, he, he has the correct answer. It's just on the next slide. Um, the point is you can't append an else anywhere in here, right? Because if I put an else here, then it would automatically print print obtain credit score. Right? This, with our tool set currently, this, is, well, this would be the only way of writing it, um, which is ugly and long. Right? So I'm going to add another thing to our if statement, another type of decoration called an else if. Right? So this is a statement that is basically exactly for that last slide. So you always start with an if, and then you have multiple conditions now. You can have condition 0, 
up through condition n. So if condition 0 is true, then run this code. Else if condition 1 is true, then run this code. Else if condition n is true, then run this code. Right? So note, as soon as one of these conditions is true, the if statement stops and exits. Right? It, it, all the conditions aren't tested. This is, this, is, this is a big difference between listing if statements consecutively and tying if statements together in one long statement. So maybe examples will make this more clear. But first I have the picture again. So this is our new picture. Uh, I'm going to do the picture for two else statements. But really, you should be able to make this arbitrarily wide. So it reads something like this. If condition 1 is true, then run block 0 and continue the program. Otherwise, if condition 0 is false, then check condition 1. If condition 1 is true, then execute block 1 and continue with the program. Else if C1 is false, check condition 2. If condition 2 is true, execute block 2 and continue. Otherwise, if C2 condition is false, continue. Right? So I'm just going to write this red line here because in this one, since I don't have an else, it is the case that the entire if structure can be skipped. So, oh, okay, kind of a screwy example because I already used the else, but whatever. Um, so that's the last statement on the last slide, compactified now, right? made, made a little bit better. So now, here's exactly the structure for what I was trying to do. If your credit is poor, do this. Else, if your credit is good, do this. Else, if your credit is excellent, do this. Else, print this, right? So th this else captures any condition that is not satisfied up through here. But again, exactly one of these code blocks is going to execute. Exactly one, right? If this else wasn't here, if I remove this, then at most one would execute, perhaps none. Right? So again, there's a big difference between putting if statements in sequence, where they each get the opportunity to toggle, whereas you tie in consecutive if statements using this elif. And in that case, one will get executed. So here's an example. X is true, Y is false. <clears throat> if not X, answer is panda. Elif, X and Y, answer is snake. Else if not X or Y, answer is badger. So let's step through this. So if not X, so X is true, not X is false. So this statement gets skipped or executed. Skipped. X is true, okay, and Y is false. So this is false, so this code gets skipped. Not x is false or false, so this code gets skipped, which means the solution, which means answer has the value of not defined, right? Not, not a single one of these code statements executed. Okay? Um, just going to show you, even though I have already, that of course you can just stick the else statement to the end of this else if block, right? Just to basically else is kind of uh, redundant in this case because you can always just write else if true and that gives you the last statement but um, it's nice to see else from like a programmer perspective because it really clearly shows that something is going to happen okay so here's the picture now when I include the else block same as the discussion before except uh, when you have the final condition here C2 uh, if this was false, rather than continuing, it would run the else block and then continue. So I can do the same example and simply append uh, else, answer is man bear pig, and ask what the answer is. And in this case, the answer is, so this was false, so this didn't execute. This was false, so this didn't execute. This was false, so this didn't execute. Else will for sure execute because everything else can't, uh, was false. Answer gets assigned man bear pig, so answer is man bear pig. It exists, swear to God. Um, as observed before, we can nest if statements. Right? That is to say, uh, I can put an if statement in an if statement, right? which basically means you have like multiple branches. So I can say if x is greater than 0, then print x is positive. Furthermore, if x is greater than 1, then print x is not small. And furthermore, if x is greater than 10 to the power of 10, print x is pretty big. 
Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I want to study this example a bit in the uh, code. So let me write something like this: if x is greater than zero, uh, print hello. Um, if the absolute value of x is greater than ten, do I have absolute value? Is that something that in our system? Absolute value is greater than 10, then print world. And then furthermore, if x is greater than uh, 10 to the power of 5, print this is huge number. OK, so if I call, let me just wrap this in a function. OK, so what happens if I call f of, let's say, 12? Yes. I have incorrect indenting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so note that you can highlight stuff in this and move it back and forth. That's kind of useful. Okay. Still not nested. If Oh, sh yikes. OK. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That's better. Yeah? Good. Okay. So if I call f of 12, what's gonna ha what's gonna happen? So x will get assigned 12. 12 is greater than zero. So this prints hello. Um, the absolute value is greater than 10, so it prints world. And it's not bigger than this, so this doesn't happen. So none gets returned. So let me just type this here. Python 3 Tuesday. Hello world. Right. Okay. So let's try to flip the script a bit. I'm going to reverse these conditions. And I'm going to make this minus 10 to the power of 6. So what happens here? Um, well, you tell me. What gets printed? So I go into this function with 10 to the minus 10 to the power of 6. Is, 10, is the absolute value of minus 10 to the power of 6 greater than 10? Yes. yes. So it prints world. Is minus 10 to the power of 6 greater than 0? No. So this fails. So this whole thing gets skipped and we return. Right. So this should print only world. Right. OK. What happens now if I do? I'm going to pull this out like this. And I'm going to also change this to an absolute value. Right? So, OK, let, let's do this one step at a time. I'll change that to an absolute value. And I'll run the same thing again. And so the same thing will happen, right? Because x isn't bigger than 0. So all of this gets skipped. OK. I'm going to move this if statement back one, which means now it's part of this condition. So what gets printed now? So let's walk through it. I have minus 10 to the power of 6. I walk into f. Absolute value of minus 10 to the power of 6 is greater than 10, so world gets executed. Minus 10 to the power of 6 is not greater than 0, so this code is skipped. However, since I move this one back, it is now part of this if, if statement. So this also now has an opportunity to be toggled. If the absolute value of minus 10 to the power of 6 is greater than 10 to the power of 5, then print this is a huge number. So this should be printed. Just going to go into here and you'll see that. Okay. I can also uh, pull this back more. But in this example, this is not actually uh, changing anything. Um, so I want you to go to the labs this week, play around with this, these if statements, nest them, unnest them, uh, play around with the conditions. Um, Next time we're going to talk about, I guess tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about code refactoring, which is a term you may have heard before. Uh, this is the fancy term for making your code more simple. It's easy to make these if statements very complicated, uh, overly complicated, and unnecessarily complicated. I'm going to teach you how to undo that. So you guys have a good day.